Okay, so I think we can start. Welcome again. This is the second webinar organized by NG Atlantic uh, you for the fifth open call. We organize these webinars for each of our open calls to help you get through the application process and to receive uh, suggestions and feedback from the people who did it before you and were successful, our previous applicants. So we hope you will enjoy today's presentation. The webinar lasts an hour and a half. We start with the presentation of the project by Jacopo Mariani, my colleague from Trust IT, and then Jim Clark from Waterford Institute of Technology will guide us through the topics of the fifth open call and the uh, NSF DCL for US funding, which um, was introduced uh, during during the project at a later stage. This wasn't there in the beginning, so it's a great news for US partners. And we'll go through the most common FAQ. And uh, finally, we'll get to the presentations of our projects uh, until uh, 5.30. We have seven projects from our previous previous call, in particular from our fourth open call presenting today. Uh, so you can see all of our speakers here. And uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll just go through the, the, the project presentation. So we are going to have uh, Kent Yu uh, with Levin Gürgen and um, Fed, Fed Intersect. Then we have Varsa University of Technology presenting experiment on security features of multi-provider mobile network infrastructure with Jordi Mongay Bataya and George Xilomenos from Athens University of Economic and Business with the security content delivery and provenance. Uh, we have Technical University of Greece with George Caricinos, secure communication based on robust 3D localization. Finally, Guido Marchetto from the Polytechnic of Torino, distributing learning for resilient virtual network management at scale, and Nicolas Nicolaou uh, from Algoisis LTD with Ares, and Viviana Rigoni from Sapienza University of Rome, presenting vulnerability assessment and robust defenses for optimized attacks in dynamic SDNs. Um, yeah, this is uh, the... Uh, projects that we've been presenting. And Jacob, if you go to the next slide, we, I, yeah, I'll actually leave the microphone to you for the presentation of the NG Atlantic project. In, I guess you know already a lot of this project, uh, about this project, but we'll just uh, go through uh, the generic overview. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Christina, for the introduction. So now I will give you a brief introduction and overview of our project, so the NGA Atlantic Tattoo project. Uh, so it started in January 2020 and it's going to end in December 2022, so the, the end of this year. And the aim of the NGA Atlantic Tattoo project is to find EU-based researcher and innovators to carry out next generation of internet-related experiment, of course, in collaboration with EU researcher teams. Um, so, so a brief introduction. So we have uh, five open calls. We had five open calls. This one is the fifth one, uh, with a total of 2.8 million euros budget for the EU participants. Uh, the range, the, the project funding range, is between 25,000 uh, to 50,000, and from a minimum of, of three months, from a, uh, and a maximum of six months. Uh, as I said before, for in this moment we are at the fifth open call, so we had four uh, before, and uh, this fifth open call will end. Uh, the 31st of March, by the end of this month. Uh, so moving on, now we can see some statistics um, of our previous open calls. We can see that the ratio uh, of the four previous open calls is quite good. So we had in the, in the last one a ratio of one, one out of two. That is quite good. And on the, on the right side of the slide, you can see um, some application statistics and the world statistics of the previous open call. So we had um, 126 uh, third party applicants from the EU and 109 from the US. And, and moving on with, with uh, all the other statistics. Uh, so now I will explain you briefly how our website is created and how you can uh, apply uh, to, to the fifth open call. 
So um, this one is the home page of our website. Um, you have to log in, and if you don't have an account, you have to register to, to one account, and then go to my dashboard on the top over the, the menu, the first menu. When you click to my dashboard, you will see this uh, page coming up. Uh, you can see that there are two uh, boxes, one blue and one white. The white one um, under the, the blue box is basically a chat where you can ask questions and concerns that you have to, to us. And the blue box is the box that you have to press to apply, that is bringing you to the, to the form that you have to fill. So this one is the form. There are going to be uh, a few questions, open and closed questions. Um, and as you can see, you have two bottom after the, the application that is save the draft, save the draft and submit your application. Uh, of course, please keep in mind that you have to save the draft before to leave the page or to close the page, because if you don't save your draft, you are going to lose all the all the um, the information that you that you got. When you finish your application and you are ready to submit, please submit your application with the yellow button. And remember, uh, as soon as you submit your application, it's difficult that you can uh, go back and open it again the the application to make changes. Uh, so here we have our word limits. Uh, remember that the word limits is just a suggestion it's not mandatory but it's better if you if you follow this this rule so you are going to see that there are some questions that the maximum length is 600 words and some that are 300 words uh, at the beginning of the application please remember that there is there are some recommendations since we in the in the previous open call we we reported some data losses um and in order to to, to not lose data in, uh, during your application, please follow, follow these quick rules are just three or four rules that, that you have to follow that are really, really easy. Uh, if you don't have a US or EU partner, please join the Twinning Lab. Uh, what is the Twinning Lab? The Twinning Lab is a space for researchers, innovators, and startups from EU and US. Uh, to discover and connect with transatlantic across and establish complementary partnership. So this is uh, something that you can use uh, if you don't have partners and you, you need to find some partners for your experiment. Here you can join and contact uh, some EU and US partners based on what you, what you need. And of course, we are um, revamping all this tuning lab. So there is going to be a new interface coming soon. Uh, in order to give a more user-friendly navigation during for the user, and of course, if you uh, if you want to keep yourself updated with our events and our articles, please uh, feel free to um, join our community and follow us on social media and Twitter and LinkedIn, and subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you very much. Now I will leave the floor to Jim Clark, the ngatlantic.eu project coordinator. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jacopo. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. And thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, so I'm going to take you through the uh, background and the priority topics for uh, the open call. Uh, so <clears throat> Just as uh, Jacobo mentioned, the open call is open until the end of the month. And you know, here's the different uh, websites that are available. Uh, there's information available on the Dear Colleague letter from the NSF, which, which I'll be presenting in a, a few moments uh, as well. It's uh, quite a straightforward process uh, to follow. <clears throat> uh, and, um, and it's been very successful uh, to date. Um, and then there, there is a YouTube video of a, a longer uh, workshop that was held uh, back in, um, uh, in the middle of last year or, or the third quarter of last year in which um, we presented a, a quite a number of these topics in a bit more detail. We had experts from both the EU and US um, there as well. So you, you can watch that as well. Um, so in terms of the topics themselves, uh, similar to our previous open calls, we have two different categories. The first category A is on EU-US experimental platforms interconnection. 
Um, and I'll be going into uh, quite a lot more detail on each and every one of these, uh, but just you know, very briefly, this is if you have two uh, platforms, like perhaps um, you know an already existing platform in the EU, and you want to uh, interconnect with um, an existing uh, wired or wireless platform in the US, um, you can use this particular category um, to do so. And um, this is something that um, has been, been quite successful uh, in, in the past open calls. And in fact, um, these interconnections have, have, um, you know, have been used in, in some of the uh, uh, other open call projects. And then the second category is uh, sort of the more traditional uh, one focusing on you know, the key enabling technologies in the NGI topics. And we have, um, similar to our previous open calls, we have five different topics. And the way that these topics are selected um, is we are in close con consultation with our sister projects, the other NGI RIA projects that are funded within the NGI initiative on the various topics um, for, for next generation internet. And we're you know, continuously polling them to find, you know, where results are coming from their own, um, from, you know, their own projects uh, on, you know, within their topic areas, um, because our focus is primarily, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is primarily for taking results and experimenting with um, the US team on an experimental platform. So uh, we, we you know, want to make sure that the results are available within these NGI topics. And once they become available, we then uh, include them in our uh, list of topics for EU-US cooperation. Okay, um, and so uh, in this particular call, we have a brand new one um, uh, because the ICT 56 uh, 2021 um, blockchain and distributed ledger uh, technologies for NGI uh, projects, of which there are three RIA projects, um, they have indicated to us that they now have some very good results coming out of their uh, open call uh, projects. And so therefore, you know, we felt that it's a good time now to, um, to uh, allow them to, uh, the, these innovators to become um, involved in, in EU US projects. Okay, so um, the, uh, the call foresees uh, one type of proposal um, because you know, as we're getting near to the end of our project, um, we, we have um, we basically have, have shortened the um, uh, durations and also the, uh, the funding available uh, to be 25,000 minimum and maximum 50,000. And um, you know, this is to ensure that we have at least five to seven projects being funded. Um, it also is more in line with the funding that's, uh, that's available in, on the US side as well. So, um, which I'll, I'll discuss in a bit more detail later. Okay, so just getting into a bit more uh, detail on the topics themselves. So as I mentioned before, the uh, category A is for uh, the twinning of um, uh, established uh, designers and facility providers of experimental infrastructures, test beds, and platforms. So it's, um, you know, it's available for those who want to, you know, interconnect with one another across uh, the Atlantic. Uh, with the caveat that they should offer their facilities on a continuous basis to the community of experimenters and application developers in any NGI-related topics. And, um, you know, as mentioned, it would be expected that the facilities could be used for experimentation um, of NGI projects uh, present and future. Okay, um, the, then uh, when we get into the NGI topics, um, the first topic is on strengthening trustworthiness and resilience of the internet. So this is looking at uh, experimentation of results um, on topics related to increasing trustworthiness and resilience uh, of the internet. Um, so this could include issues such as um, um, trust, trustworthiness issues in relations to uh, identity 
you know, for example, self-sovereign identities, authentication and authorization, traceability, uh, privacy and confidentiality related to personal and non-personal interactions or flow of sensitive information over geographic boundaries. Um, looking at cryptograph cryptographic solutions um, to improve trustworthiness, transparency and accountability. Um, for example, certificate transparency and looking at federated collaborative and or decentralized technologies for supporting internet-wide e-identities with various levels of identification, reputation, and trust to serve as a new basis for business models. Okay, uh, and also, you know, uh, looking at resilience issues, um, which may include uh, approaches for monitoring, detection, and mitigation to counter large-scale disruptions, failures, or ongoing impending cyber attacks, intrusions, and support for crisis situations. Um, so these may include techniques for resource redundancy and dynamic reconfiguration, self-healing, uh, network isolation and virtualization te techniques, situation awareness, survivability. Okay, uh, the next uh, NGI topic is open internet architecture renovation. So uh, this topic has been um, uh, quite active in since uh, 20, uh, 2021, uh, there's, there's been a, a re of funding projects. So it will focus on experiments supporting communities of developers and ensuring internet architecture evolution towards better efficiency, scalability, security, and resilience. Um, so looking at auditing, testing, and improving protocols and open source software and hardware used to manage the internet with renewed design goals, such as isolation of contingencies, redundancy and self-repair, disruption tolerance, transparency, better real-time behavior and energy efficiency, and um, the ability to roll out in internet scale um, should be assessed as part of the proposed solutions. And then another topic that uh, has been um, Flag is being very important um, by our sister project, uh, the NGI Forward project, which is looking at the um, sort of policy um, angle from the NGI initiative. Uh, they've identified a sustainable and climate friendly internet as one of the key eight NGI topics, uh, setting out a, a vision for a better, more human centric future internet and inform the initiative's policy and technology research agenda. Um, so I, I uh, have a link here to uh, two white papers that they have done. So please, you know, you can have a look at this um, to, to get some insight in, into this uh, important topic. So it'll focus on EU US experiments of results related to uh, use case implementations of innovative internet technologies and transparency mechanisms on EU US experimental platform shown to fight against climate change with a significant improvement of energy efficiency, carry out measurements to create awareness of environmental impact of the internet and promotion of technologies that help reduce the energy consumption and carbon emission. And this, uh, this particular topic is also uh, quite important from the perspective of the, uh, um, the National Science Foundation as well, because um, you know, they, they are funding quite large uh, platforms, both wired and wireless, and they're always looking at ways, um, you know, to, um, to uh, capture the, you know, the carbon footprint of um, these particular platforms and, and um, investigate ways of, of improving these. So, so this, this is also a topic that has been highly endorsed by the uh, NSF as well, and um, the partners that, that we're, we're um, talking to in the US. Okay, uh, so it welcomes EU US applicants that can provide an experiment with transparency mechanisms and sustainability metrics on the environmental cost of the internet. And uh, another topic that was um, uh, promoted by the NSF was internet data sharing and interoperable services. And this was because they have um, a, a particular uh, NSF-funded um, platform, which is uh, looking at these um, 
you know, these topics. So addressing the challenge of sharing network data, siloed in different internet regions across geographic boundaries and enabling trusted internet services by composition and orchestration of globally distributed services. So looking at things such as secure and privacy pre preserving data sharing, uh, which is particularly important to address the rising cyber threats and incidents, uh, sharing of internet data to support the continuous monitoring and data-driven analysis is critical to identify impending ongoing attacks, support trace back and attributions and intelligently responding to internet events, and also experiments related to such cross-domain data sharing challenges to enable cyber threat identification, risk assessment, and incident management, and enabling secure and interoperable internet services are of particular interest. So um, just in contrast with the service and data portability and um, you know, uh, topic, uh, this relates to the role of data sharing for the purposes of cybersecurity ra rather than uh, for services um, and applications. And then the topic uh, that I mentioned previously, where there's now uh, results coming out of uh, our, our sister um, projects onto chain, uh, True Glow, and NGI Assure. Um, it's uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies for NGI. So uh, the topic will create opportunities to enhance services and processes in both the public and private sectors, notably providing better control of data by citizens and organizations, reducing fraud, improving record keeping, access, transparency, and audibility within and across borders at multiple levels, you know, looking at it from the technology infrastructure and application levels. So there are a number of uh, key areas um, uh, you can consider where the results can be brought into the open calls, um, you know, um, specifically experiments on platforms in areas involving, but not limited to a new software ecosystem for trusted, traceable, and transparent ontological knowledge management, uh, reinforcing the European blockchain ecosystem to develop a more human internet, and also um, innovative results to fight misinformation on social media with an emphasis on using blockchain and DLTs. Okay, so these topics are, are mapping onto the, the three projects that I just mentioned. Um, and of course, uh, you know, even though we are mapping to the, uh, the projects that are in, in the uh, NGI initiative, of course, um, uh, ngiatlantic.eu is open to you know all innovators. You don't have to be participating to a um, um, another funded project. Um, it, it's just that we're using the same topics, uh, obviously, to be consistent with the uh, with you know the topics in the NGI initiative. But um, all, all are welcome to participate in our open calls. Okay. So um, since our third open call, we've had the, um, uh, uh, the very good news that the National Science Foundation has uh, provided a, a joint program um, alongside with our project. And um, I'll just uh, be presenting uh, that now. And then also I'll present some other um, possibilities for uh, US funding if, if your uh, US partner does not uh, qualify for this one in particular. Okay, <clears throat> so the dedicated program was launched in February 2021 as a Dear Colleague Letter or DCL as it's known in the US um, for existing grant holders. So this is a supplemental um, fund that is provided to existing grant holders and it, it you know, it turns out it's a, it's a very um, good way to, to provide uh, funding, you know, without the huge administrative burden that, that we're more used to here in the, in the EU. And so this uh, particular DCL, which is labeled 21-048, um, is for existing US NSF grantees uh, to team up uh, specifically with NGI uh, Atlantic.eu uh, partners if they're if they're in a successful application, um, but you you must apply um, at 
you know, uh, I'll explain in a moment that uh, everyone must apply for the uh, NSF DCL um, at the time or, or within one week of the application, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, so it's open to active NSF funded researchers within the NSF's computer and network systems core um, uh, in a program and also the security, the secure and trustworthy cyberspace programs. So between these two programs, there are a, a very, very large amount of um, uh, projects being funded. So if the grantee um, belongs within you know, one of these programs, they would be in, uh, entitled to participate in the, uh, or to submit the DCL 21-048, okay? So the funding that's available for the NSF grantee is up to 100,000 US dollars or 20% of the original grant budget for uh, the maximum duration of one year. And uh, this is very important. The duration must fall within the period of their existing NSF grant period. Okay, um, and then the the uh, proposers uh, still have to explain uh, on on your application um, uh, to our platform. Um, we ask that you uh, still explain how the partners will fund their activities independently from the DCL and the proposals will be evaluated and selected based only on this information. The reason for this is because the uh, DCLs themselves undergo um, an evaluation on the NSF side and you know uh, there's no guarantee that you know that particular DCL will be successful so um, so we, we um, the US partners you know should be, uh, committing to the work, even if they finally do not receive their funding through the uh, DCL, okay? And th this was a particular um, uh, caveat that the NSF um, made us um, put into, into our um, uh, proposals or into our process. And then all supplemental requests are subject to the NSF's merit review process. And I'll give you some more details on that process, okay? The other important thing is that um, there are no difference will be done in the evaluation process between the proposals with NSF funded partners and the others. So all proposals will have equal opportunities and will be selected based exclusively on their merits. Okay, so, you know, just to be clear, so just be if a proposal has um, a DCL, you know, a partner or um, mentions a DCL, it doesn't give it, you know, um, additional score or points uh, as a result of that. Um, and so the, all of the proposals are done exclusively on their merits according to the criteria um, that is that is set out uh, in the evaluation. Okay, the deadline for submission of the supplemental funding request for consideration is within a week of our open call deadline. So that means for open call five, it must be submitted to the NSF by the 7th of April, 2022. Um, the good news is that it's fairly straightforward and the US partners are generally very um, aware of what needs to be done. And so basically it's, it's four items, although as it turns out, um, the NSF were accepting the PDF file from the submission to cover the second and the third bullet point here. So the summary of the active research award, including the original research vision, goals, activities, and accomplishments, spanning the intellectual merit and broader impacts and how this award is related to the proposed work for the NGI Atlantic.eu open call. This is about a page length and it's, it's a standard uh, format, although it has to be customized obviously to explain how the uh, uh, active research award and the proposed work for uh, the ngatlantic.eu project uh, are you know, applicable to each other and relevant to each other. Um, then the second bullet is the project description that was submitted to the NGI Atlantic Open Call. So um, 
And, and the third is the biosketch of the EU lead partner, which is typically a one page. Um, but what the NSF has said is uh, that they will accept the PDF file of the um, other proposal um, in lieu of both of those, these bullet points. So you don't have to do a separate biosketch of the EU lead partner because obviously it's already included in the, the PDF file. And then uh, lastly, there is a, um, a template for a justification of the need for the supplemental funds request. So this is um, sort of a lightweight um, template that again, the US participants in uh, NSF funded projects would be very aware of these templates and how to fill them out. So they're quite straightforward. And I, I understand it's only half a page or a page uh, in length. So really, you know, what needs to be done is, is, is quite straightforward. And we have a link here for further information and the NSF contact points. Uh, the NSF contact points are um, very, very helpful and generally will get back to um, any, any questions or um, applicants uh, very quickly with any, uh, you know, with answers to any questions you may have. Okay, uh, now if your US partner is not involved in one of those two, uh, two programs that I mentioned earlier, there still is some possible uh, ways of getting NSF funds. Um, so if you have, um, um, and I'm just presenting some examples here, okay? So there, there's some, programs underway already in uh, the in the wired space in particular uh, you have the uh, fabric test beds the fabric test bed um, which is is sort of a uh, extension and um, uh, of the genie and the enter um, test beds um, and it, it's the same same partners that that uh, have been involved in in all of these um, you know wired platform projects down through the years, um, and then the in the cloud uh, area there's two cloud projects the Chameleon and the Cloud Lab uh, project, so there could be some potential if if you're um, involved in a proposal related to a cloud based. Um, you know, uh, topics you you could uh, you know make contact with them, and and many of these are on our twinning lab uh, that was mentioned earlier. Then in the wireless domain, the program for advanced wireless research, there are uh, four projects at the moment. Um, the first two have been running for a, quite a number of years. Cosmos, which is based in the New York area and Powder Renew, which is based in the, uh, in, in the uh, Salt Lake City area. Uh, they're both um, city scale uh, platforms in, in, in those areas. Um, then there's uh, the AirPaw Air <clears throat> uh, project. And the most recent one is the uh, uh, ARA uh, project. Now, what's interesting about these is the, uh, they have a supplemental fund. It's also a DCL, a Dear Colleague Letter, um, but it's specifically for, um, uh, for these um, PAWR projects. And it's available to all US-based academics and researchers, um, uh, but it, it, you have to just keep in mind that it's available for active NSF-funded wireless researchers. Um, for receiving connection and support to the platforms. And this um, can provide up to 50,000 US dollars um, to, to these, okay? Now, just as a note, while not specifically designated for international connections, there could be some scope to utilize this fund for teaming up with an EU partner. And uh, we've had a number of um, open call projects which have availed of this particular one. And the nice thing about, well, there's two nice things about this. Number one, as I mentioned, you don't have to be um, in one of those uh, two, two programs that I mentioned earlier for the, um, for the um, 
the 21-048 DCL with Inge Atlantic. Um, so for this one, you could be, you know, a um, an active NSF funded wireless research. So you could be in any other NSF uh, grant outside of those programs. And there, there's many, many grants. And then the second thing that's nice about this as well is that in addition to the US partner getting the funds, you also get the support of the um, platforms themselves. So they, they will work with um, the project team um, in the setup of the um, of the, the work that you're going to be doing in the project. And again, they have a similar application process and the information is available on how to apply um, uh, at, the, um, at the, the website given here. Okay, then another one to keep in mind as well that um, in 2021, there was uh, an, quite a large number of projects were launched uh, in the International Research and Education Network Connections Program um, of the NSF, the IRNC. And a number of these projects have objectives related to collaboration with international partners, including EU partners. Okay, now obviously these, um, you know, it's not just the EU, it's, it's uh, worldwide, but still it, it can be utilized for connecting uh, with EU partners. So. Um, if you look through those projects, uh, just some examples, uh, the Cosmos um, PAWR platform has an IRNC project called Cosmic, uh, which enables uh, uh, their uh, platform to connect with um, Japan, Brazil, and EU. So there could be some scope with uh, partnering with um, partners that are involved in Cosmos. And then another one is Fabric that I mentioned they have an IRNC project called FAB. So there are, in fact, there's a number of different um, sub projects under the FAB um, project. And a number of these um, are connecting the fabric um, nodes and, and networks um, across the Atlantic and across the globe, actually. So there could be some scope in, in you know, getting um, getting those US researchers involved in, in their IRNC project is, is basically covering that, okay? And a number of these have been listed in our 20 lab. Okay. Um, Tim. Yes, Christina. Hi. Thanks, thanks very much for, for the presentation. Just to let you know that Deep Medi is here in case oh, Deep, you would like to say anything, to add anything about these, please feel free to... Um, to take the microphone. Hi, thanks for Hi. joining us. Hi, I, I, Jim. Um, I apologize. I was away for 12 days and uh, without uh, my NSF email and I was catching up on all the email and then I saw that you're invited at the meeting like about 10 minutes ago. Uh, so yeah, it looks like you covered uh, pretty much the thing that we were uh, planning from the US side in terms of the uh, the supplemental award, you have to realize that it is that you, the US side must be, must have an active award under the CNS core program or, or the, or the, or the SETC program, which is a secure and trustworthy cyberspace program. And, uh, and then you can submit it and get funded from our side. And um, that's important to know. Uh, but what I want to clarify that that does not, if you do not have any US funding, that doesn't preclude you from not being able to submit an, a request because you may get funding from the EU side, NG Atlantic side, but not from our side. So you can still do that. There have been a few who have been funded. Um, so, so that's sort of you know, important for uh, you to note that. Uh, as Jim mentioned that there is also the power supplement. So for anything related to wireless side, you could under submit something under the power supplement. And there are four platforms now available as uh, Jim is showing on this slide number 27, uh, uh, the Cosmos, uh, uh, Powder, Arpo and Ara. So you could, uh, Ara is I don't think right now ready for, um, 
testing anything yet, but uh, you could still contact the PR, you know, the platform coordinator to find out what it is. Uh, beyond that, there are other platforms like Chameleon and Fabric that you can use this for that. You do not need funding. You just need to have some uh, US collaborator. Uh, that's all I wanted to uh, say at this point, and I'm happy to answer any Q&A that comes up later on. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Deep. J just in terms of the application process for the power of um, supplements, is it is it similar, or can you maybe go through that a little bit um, about mm -hmm. what, what okay. the difference is uh, between right. that and the other? Now, that's a very, very, very good question, Jim. Uh, uh, just to clarify, there are two DCL. One is the USU DCL 21-048. For that one, uh, you know, we go by the process that NG Atlantic has established, and then we consider funding if uh, you know based on how the evaluation process works for from the EU side to to get funded, and then we do an, an assessment from our side to go forward. On the other hand, under the power supplement, power has their own internal assessment process. So uh, if you wanted to do that, you would you can send me an email. I think the power supplement still lists me as one of the uh, program director, but is now handled by two of my colleagues, Alex Princeton and Rod Turlock. So I can forward it to them and they have a set of questions for you before you submit the award that they want to know whether uh, topically you are eligible to use uh, or uh, request for power supplement. So that you need to be aware of and then they will do an assessment working with the platforms to say whether they will, you know, you're considered for funding. Uh, in the, uh, we have uh, got a couple of them funded in the last couple of rounds. So, it is possible to get funded under the power supplement. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for that, Deep. <clears throat> thank you. Okay. Can, can you stay on for a while, Deep? Because we have some really nice um, projects uh, presenting. Uh, how long is the session today? I'm sorry. It, to ask. it will finish in about 45 minutes. So, uh, I, I, yes, that should work out. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what, what I get, what, okay, what I can do, um, uh, Christine, if it's okay with you, perhaps um, since we have all the speakers here, we we can start uh, the talks right away, um, and then you know, if there's time left, I can come back to the FAQs. Would that be okay, Christine? Um, yes. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes. It's uh, it's fine for me. Uh, let me. Uh, get back to the agenda. So the first, um, sorry, get back to the slide. We have the first presentation from uh, Levent. Uh, would would that be okay for you, Levent? Start before, or or otherwise we can continue with the FAQ and start the presentations at five. Just let us know if it would be fine for that you. Is, Just. I think it's best to do that. I think it's okay to do the. Q and A. I mean, unless it goes long, obviously, I I'm fine with it. I I look at my schedule. I'm free till for forty five minutes. So, you know, either way is fine with me. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I I think we can go ahead with the talks, Christina, because I yeah. just have a couple of slides that I can cover at the end. Okay. And okay. It'd be so, nice to give the projects a bit more time. Sure. Uh, then, Levent, I'm going. I'm leaving the floor to you. Are you? I think you're already able to share the screen. You don't need permission from myself, right? So. Um, yeah, I think so. I'll try. Right. Can see my screen. Yes. Yes. Perfect. You cannot see me. I just close up my maybe Come on. I, I could see it before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I just wanted to turn on my camera so, oh, so that okay. <laughs> sure. it can be interactive. 
Um, so you can still see my screen? It's just a little bit small now, Levent. Can you okay, bring it yeah, back? Yeah, I will make it. That's better. Okay. Here we go. Okay, yes. Yeah, so our project named Fed Intersect, uh, EU US Federated Testbed for Cross Atlantic Experiments for Urban Smart Intersections. So I'm representing KenQ as its uh, CEO, and this project uh, partners are Columbia University in the city of New York, Rutgers University, and University of Cantabria at KenQ. So um, the actual the objective of our project is very specific, is making intersections smarter to save lives. Um, here at the right, you see a recent tweet from the mayor of New York City. Uh, it was just right after a mortal accident of a 15-year-old girl actually killed by a school bus that was just turning uh, right at an intersection and didn't see the, the young girl. And similarly, in the US and EU, EU, actually, there are the half of the road accident occur in intersections and many of them ending up with fatalities. And indeed, new generation enablers like IoT, 5G, AI, edge cloud computing have great potential to save lives. Uh, but we still need to uh, make real life tests. Um, we need those real life settings to test and validate uh, those innovative applications with great uh, social, environmental, and economic impact. So the project is indeed exactly about this, federating two important city-scale testbeds. At left, you see an advanced wireless testbed setup uh, by Columbia University and Rutgers University in Manhattan, New York. And um, it includes a real-life setting, indeed, of an intersection testbed equipped with uh, smart cameras, edge computing nodes, for instance, and high-speed uh, connections. Um, and at right, you see the one of the pioneer smart city in Europe, Santander, and it's smart Santander city testbed with more than 2,000 deployed IoT devices around the city, measuring different environmental parameters, as well as uh, traffic cameras. Um, so these two testbeds will allow us accessing to real life data in the cities from intersections and roundabouts um, in order to build smart and safe intersection tests. Um, and can't use open source uh, our role in the need to provide our um, open source smart city platform as a federating uh, platform, which will collect uh, the data from those test pests and also will provide the um, um, the other way interaction possibilities with the environment um, to analyze the data, process the data to detect dangerous situations, um, and also to do traffic analysis. We will be providing APIs for experimenters um, that will be easily accessing not only uh, raw data, but also process data in order to build smart intersection and roundabout application experiments. It will be actually basically collecting information like the, the vehicles passing, the pedestrians, their average uh, speed, what are the dangerous situations like collision, collision um, um, possibilities, um, what is the, uh, if there are some uh, vehicles that going over the speed limit, passing the red light, what is the average crossing time of the pedestrian. So all of this information will serve us to, to better manage those um, intersections and also detect those dangerous situations. So we will be providing a common uh, data analysis tool that will be used across federated testbeds. So the same tool will be used for those two different um, settings. Similarly, an application development tool, uh, which will allow indeed to experimenters with some common APIs, some common tools that uh, will allow them to build uh, those um, scalable and replicable applications. So this is a bit the what our object, uh, our project is about. So I have, as requested by by the organizers, I have added here a couple of uh, hints and tips from my side. Um, so how I uh, kind of build the project with the partners. So we want to be real, very impact oriented. So we really identify a real challenge, a very impactful challenge that we want to um, target. And in our case, it was a great social impactful um, objective, let's say a project. 
Um, the second, indeed, it was very important to engage some early discussions with the US partners to well define the scope and the content of the project. We actually have started our discussions with another uh, related NGI um, initiative, which was the NGI Explorers, which allowed us to engage these first discussions. So it was uh, very precious and very um, important for us to start those discussions with our US partners. Um, and uh, to be to provide that impact that we are looking for, indeed, we for sure define those um, individual specific measurable and achievable objectives. So technical objectives in particular, but also uh, objectives in terms of collaboration, what we are targeting later, um, you know, the collaborative publications, uh, collaborative um, after this project, future opportunities together, and in addition to these, you know, performance related technical objectives um, that we want to achieve. And which is also very important is indeed, in our case, we are four partners um, uh, in part of this, this project. So it's very important to find the complementarities between the EU US partners so that we use the, the you know, the strongest part of uh, of each partner so that we create the synergy of collaboration among um, those four partners. Um, and our ultimate goal is also to build an impactful, sustainable EU-US collaboration. So we want to, um, after the end of this project, continue collaborations and build other, um, other research and innovation project. And last but not least, uh, perseverance is very important because for us it was our, we had the project approval at our fourth uh, submission. So perseverance is important. Hopefully this is, I think, last your last chance probably, but um, I know that there will be some other opportunities in the horizon Europe. So just continue trying and I'm sure that at the end you will be, um, you know, um, provide the, the perfect proposal and you'll get approved by the reviewers. Thanks, that's all from my side. So feel free to ask me any question now or later offline by email. I will try to respond as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devin, um, for the insightful presentation and nice, nice project and very, very important topic. Um, so very, very nice, well um, I will now move forward to the next presentation. Um, so Hordi, Hordi, I help. I am pronouncing it right. Um, if you want to share your screen. Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I do share my presentation. It's this one. Okay, uh, hope you can see the presentation. Good, not in presenter mode, but yeah, but it's not working. So let's let's leave in this. No way. problem. So uh, our project is about uh, security in the network in five G networks. Uh, it is interesting. Our project, uh, uh, the confrontation of the uh, US way to to implement the network, to deploy the network, and the European. Uh, way so uh, in Europe we are more related. Uh, we are uh, we want to deploy a network, so the operators want to deploy a network that is, is in the classical way. So the purpose built uh, uh, infrastructure. So one of the big names of networking, I don't know, Ericsson, uh, Nokia in Europe. They implement all the network together with the machines, together with uh, this is the, the, the big idea, or at least they are responsible of this. So the vendor are responsible of the whole infrastructure. Uh, in, in USA, uh, the idea is to create a network that this is more multi vendor. So uh, one uh, vendor provides the software of the network, another vendor provides the cloud where the core of the network is implemented, another vendor provides the radio part, the radio antennas, and everything should work together. So uh, these two kinds of implementation also provides us two, two kinds of uh, uh, network uh, 
assurance. Uh, we have to distinguish here network assessment and network assurance. Network assessment is related with the mechanisms and the, and the standards and implementation of network of security into the network or the elements of the architecture of the security. Uh, the network assurance is the capacity of the infrastructure to show that is secure. And this requires, uh, obviously, some kind of external uh, checking of the, of the network of the products, but also it requires an external checking of the process, how the, the products are deployed and how the products are maintained. So the, the networking products, the networking or the, or the models you know, or the functions in, in 5G uh, are required to be maintained uh, during the whole life cycle of the function. So, so that uh, someone checks uh, the, the patches that need to be introduced, introduced for security, for new vulnerabilities, how these new vulnerabilities are checked and are, uh, and are contraposed in any way. So these uh, processes, products, processes, and, uh, and the whole life cycle of the products uh, must be checked by external partners. This is the network assurance in, in purpose-built built infrastructure and classical uh, network infrastructure. This is done by uh, by GSMA, which is a worldwide um, organization of the operators, vendors, and so on and so on. And they uh, built and maintain the NESAS, which is, is uh, really it's a certification scheme, but it's not really a certification scheme because, because uh, NESAS does not issue certificates, but however, controls, which is the level of security in the network. Uh, this is more difficult, much more difficult when the network is uh, uh, implemented by different providers, because, for example, the, the uh, cloud who contains, I don't know, Amazon, Google, any cloud, you know, is not, uh, is not inside of NESAS of this scheme, of this uh, certificate, let's call certificate the scheme. Um, and this is the, the problem of our uh, project. We want to, to do some kinds of measurements of the network in the, for the purpose built for the classical infrastructure and for the multi-vendor infrastructure and try to uh, put a methodology to uh, ensure the, the security that the network is secure. So to, to provide network assurance uh, in, in both the in both the infrastructures, the purpose built and the, uh, and the multi-vendor infrastructure. So, uh, so that we will try to uh, measure the, the network, both the infrastructures and to provide a methodology for, um, for introducing network assurance. We will uh, do, in addition, some academic activities between the US partner and the EU partner so that we can um, change, exchange the, uh, all the knowledge about security and security uh, assurance that we can provide in, in USA and in Europe. Um, okay, uh, so uh, the idea is to contain the methodology for testing the, the infrastructure to provide a methodology for network assurance because the methodology for testing is for testing network assessment. And we, from this measurement, we need to provide a methodology for network assurance in, in both the method, in both the infrastructures, especially in multi-vendor in multi infrastructure because in purpose built more or less is done by GSMA. Uh, and we will do this based on a standards on ISO uh, standards that are used in Europe that are more than 2766 and the uh, ones used in the US that are more related with, with NIST standards. Mm, uh, and the last part of the, of the project will be related with the teaching courses about network assurance that will be provided in the uh, in Embley. Uh, Aeronautical University in Florida, that is a partner, the US partner, 
uh, and we provide the same course in, in Warsaw University of Technology, that this is the EU, uh, EU partner. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Jordi. Um, I will now move to the next uh, project of this project's presentation, which is George Hilomenos, I suppose, Athens University of Economics and Business. Okay, uh, I hope you can see the full view. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, our project is called Securing Content Delivery and Provenance, which short name is SECOND. Um, this is a collaboration between our group, which is headed by George Polizos, the MM Lab at the Athens University of Economics and Business, and the University of Memphis in the US, the lab of uh, Professor Christos Papadopoulos. Um, So this is actually our second project. So I have some pointers on how to succeed because we succeeded two times. Um, we had a previous project called SCN for NDN, self-certifying names for, for NDN on the second open call. And this project was about experimenting with distributed identify centralized identifiers in the NDN testbed. So the NDN testbed is a worldwide testbed of nodes running the NDN protocol, which is a name-based network architecture. Um, we expanded that to the MM Lab, um, one of the few nodes in Europe, because most of them are in the US, um, and uh, used the centralized identifiers, a method that we created, which is um, self identifying. You don't need a registry or a third party to verify your content. And we use that to create name, uh, content names um, that anybody on the network could verify that they match the data. And uh, we also use that on other architectures. We use the same idea after we did that for NDN. We also try to do that for IPFS, which where also names are secure, and uh, IoT scenarios. And in doing that, we come to the second experiment, uh, which is abbreviated second. So we wanted to do four different things. Two of them are internal to the project, and two of them are external. The first two which are internal is that when we, we did the SCN for NDN, uh, we had to do everything at the application layer. And doing it at the application layer meant that we had to manage the keys, our, the applications had to manage keys and so on. Um, so we wanted to, to, to build that into the network stack of NDN, um, not only to simplify key management, but also to allow our solution to be used also for signaling, not only for application layer messages, but for every application and every protocol that wants to use uh, self-certifying identifiers. Um, the outward facing part is, is that we wanted to do two things that we could not do in the first, in the first test. Uh, we want to add support for human readable names because um, DIDs are not human readable. They're based on cryptographic names, on cryptographic hashes and public keys. So we wanted to bind these to human readable names using certificate-less public key cryptography, which is a relatively new thing in this space. And the other thing is we want to add support for partial content retrieval using zero knowledge proofs. Uh, what we want to do here is that say you have a, content, a piece of content that is all your identity data and you have to present it to somebody. You don't want to reveal your entire data. Uh, maybe you want to persuade Facebook that you are over 18. So you want to verify, you want to, to uh, uh, reveal only your age and your name and nothing else. Now, one way to do that is to create different encrypted pieces of content for all kinds of substances of your identity. What we want to do is to encrypt the data once, um, have one identifier for that, but be able to use this identifier, which is securely bound to the content, to offer subsets of data and be able to prove that this is actually a subset of the original data. And that's what we're going to do with zero knowledge proofs. So we have both internal and external stuff going on. Um, the impact of the project, so there is a, any US part which is important for NGI Atlantic. Um, we wanted to, to bring Europe back into the ICN fold and to the forefront, that is, uh, because originally all the, the ICN research was half US, half Europe, but then the European projects died out. Uh, in the US, there was consistent, there was continued funding, and uh, the NDN test that took off, and there is a lot of engineering effort going on there, but there's no funding in, in Europe. So what we wanted to do is to go back and collaborate with the people that are doing this in the US mostly, um, and actually contribute code and discuss it with them. So bring Europe back into the ICN thing. Uh, 
Um, the impact below that is beyond that is that NDN and ICN generally is uh, it's, it's an NG architecture that's evolving. Um, there is an IRTF group that has produced two or three RFCs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and Cisco, for example, has adopted one solution called hybrid ICN, which is partially based on NDN. So it is something that is happening and we want to contribute to that by putting in new scenarios. And the other thing is unrelated to NDN and ICN, we want to do what we can do with the centralized identifiers. We find the concept of DID is very, very interesting um, and very useful in many scenarios. Um, but they suffer from something. So one of the things is that the names are not human readable. So, okay, you can bind name to content, but who is going to look up for that name? Everybody wants human readable names. And the other thing is partial content retrieval, which we are thinking of many applications of um, identities, um, IoT data, where you have a huge data set, but you only want to reveal part of that, but also people looking for it should know that it is original and authentic. So there are all kinds of applications that we think that DIDs could be useful for. Now, how to succeed? Well, I mean, first you have to have a good idea that will fit in the time frame. Um, so what has worked for us is that, you know, look at what you are trying to do. And uh, one thing is that the applications are short. They are 10 page applications. Um, and the, the most important thing there is focus on the project's impact. Why are you doing this and what, it's going, what is this going to bring to others? What's going to bring to the EU, US relationship and research? Um, how other people are going to take it up. I think this is the most important thing, that this is where you have to spend your thoughts on and then write the application so that it shows that your experiment can achieve this impact. Um, this may be for any kind of funding agency. I think impact is the most important thing. So this is a general advice that I would give to anybody, but it's especially here where you only have 10 pages. The second thing is that the projects are short, for example, three to six months. Now, in three to six months, you cannot start with two months of looking at the literature. Before applying, you have to have already completed the state of the art analysis. You know what you are doing. So you have maybe one month to do your tooling and set up, and then you have to start experiment soon. So your entire time plan, which is the third thing, is it should revolve around getting your experiments working soon and then having enough time to complete your experiments and face any unexpected difficulties and analyze your data. So when you go into the project structure where you rarely can spend more than one page in a 10 page proposal, you shouldn't think about like H2020 projects. What is the decision procedure? It's just like a couple of, of organization, you know, few people. This is not important. The important thing is that you have a very simple management structure. And then you say that my plan is this, setting up the test, doing the tests, facing difficulties, analyzing everything. So the emphasis of the project structure is again, on getting the tests running so that you can create that impact. Um, so this is my advice as you know, as two times award uh, holder and I have actually worked on, on preparing the proposals. So I, I hope it has helped everybody uh, who watched that. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, George, for this presentation. I'm sorry, I, I will switch my video off because there's just too much sun uh, in uh, Pisa today. So um, we will now go to the next presentation, which is George Karitsinas from Technical University of Crete. He's presenting secure communication based on robust 3D localization. Uh, over to you, George. Uh, thanks, Christina. Uh, let me share my screen. As a uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. As I mentioned at the beginning of uh, uh, this uh, webinar, I am on travel today, and uh, right now I have a very weak internet connection. So uh, feel free to interrupt me if you cannot uh, hear me well. Um, so our project uh, is uh, titled uh, "Secure Communication Based on Robust 3D Localization." Uh, it is a joint effort by the Technical University of Crete Telecommunications Laboratory in uh, Greece and the Florida uh, for Connected Autonomy and Artificial Intelligence in uh, Miami, Florida. Um, I, I will present uh, the part. There uh, are two teams that work together on this uh, project. Uh, I will present our part, and then uh, Dr. George Kilometis from uh, Florida Atlantic University.
university uh, of their part. Uh, the project uh, uh, started uh, on October, last October, and will end next month. And the main objective is to implement an experiment, uh, secure communication solutions for mobile wireless networks uh, based on 3D localization. So uh, we are trying to develop uh, new uh, solutions to enhance, let's say, uh, the security of uh, wireless uh, communication systems. Uh, the two partners uh, have the work is split into uh, the EU part, which is the implementation of uh, secure communication things, and the US part, which uh, has to do with the implementation of uh, the localization techniques. Actually, we merge these two parts in the end of the project. Now, uh, the, basic, the basic idea is the following. Uh, we have uh, a base station and a legitimate user, and the base station wants to transmit some data to the legitimate user. For example, these eight bits of data. Um, we can use polarization, which is a new technique. Uh, it is used in 5G, and it's actually the first uh, standard that uses uh, polarization. Uh, it was invented about 10 years ago. Uh, to polarize the bits, uh, the data, such that uh, the green ones arrive at the user without errors, while the red ones arrive with errors. Uh, this is a very uh, common approach. Uh, however, if there is uh, another user, a bad user, an eavesdropper, uh, through a wiretap channel that can record the same uh, data record, um, then polarization can uh, achieve the following. We can, through polarization, uh, uh, guarantee that the data that the eavesdropper will uh, identify will be less, the green ones, will be less than the uh, data that the legitimate user will identify. This way, the base station can hide, can hide the secret data uh, over here, the, uh, over the ones that the legitimate user can identify, but the eavesdropper cannot. Uh, to make this happen, what we need to do is to make this channel, uh, uh, the signal of this channel be stronger than the signal of the wireless channel. Uh, this is something that's uh, on our control generally, and it is not uh, something that's easy. However, uh, uh, Five systems and future systems uh, continue, uh, consist in the antennas of uh, uh, 5G uh, plus systems consist of uh, many elements. And uh, when we have many elements, we can uh, direct our signal easily to different uh, users. And if we do that, we can see here that when we direct our signal from the base station to the legitimate user, we can uh, have a significant, significant difference in the strength of the two channels. And we do this to uh, take advantage of this difference and use the polarization technique that I presented before. So the bottom line of this idea is eventually um, encoding and decoding. Um, George, I think we lost you in the last <laughs> in the last seconds. So if you could just repeat the last concept again, so, thank you. So, yes, yes. Uh, the basic idea here now is to uh, use uh, to implement these techniques on the test beds to um, demonstrate the feasibility of uh, 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 of making sure that the uh, legitimate channel will be stronger than the eavesdropper channel, and then this way. Uh, demonstrate secure uh, rates without any secret key or something else, just by directing the signal. Uh, to do this, so this is the, the uh, foundation of our project. Uh, we need two parts. We need to build uh, beamforming uh, algorithms and then, uh, or localization algorithms, and then uh, secure uh, codings. So far, we have. Um, um, we have worked on measured data um, that were collected to equipment at Rice University that are provided by the Powder new platform of uh, Salt Lake City uh, over different uh, frequencies, uh, 2.45 gigahertz. And uh, um, the setup, the main setup we used uh, consists of a base station that, uh, that uh, has uh, 
uh, 104 elements. You can see it here and here and eight users that are uh, located around the base station. Here is, uh, for example, the outdoor setup. Uh, here we can see the base station, the uh, eight users. Here is a map of the outdoor, outdoor setup. And going back to the previous figure, uh, these are photos from the indoor setup. So there, is a, there are setups that, uh, where the users are on different floors in different buildings. Um, through this, we can get uh, recordings and uh, channel traces and uh, work on them um, to, to demonstrate our algorithms. Now, um, the tasks, in short, of uh, our project is that uh, we mainly, as George Xilomenos said before, mainly by uh, of uh, experimentation and implementation. So we have experimentation of uh, lo lo robust localization. This is the part that the US partner uh, works mostly on. Uh, beamforming, this is something that we have done already. And now uh, our ongoing work is the implementation of secure communication links. Um, the, uh, there are some uh, sub items that we follow. Well, get into detail right now. Uh, we think that the project next end of next month in April uh, will have uh, will be, we will have demonstrated the feasibility of uh, having secure rates between the base station that presented before and a particular user for example user one here while the others can hear the signal but cannot decode it um, the impact is uh, apart from the uh, collaboration uh, on of uh, EU and US on uh, joint experiment uh, experiments on test beds at both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the scientific impact is the enhanced communication security that can be uh, accomplished through this technique. Uh, as I mentioned, to make this uh, happen, we need a good uh, beamform and localization uh, parts of our algorithm. So um, the localization work is some that is uh, run by the, our U.S. partners. George uh, Sklivarit now will present their work on localization. George, you can... Yes, know. thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah, if you uh, could help advance uh, the slides, that would be great. So, uh, as George mentioned, uh, our project uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is coming from supplemental funding from uh, uh, another CNS project where we have been focusing on uh, robust localization uh, in uh, underwater environments. Um, so, this, uh, this particular supplement uh, has uh, focused on uh, how can we uh, get uh, some of the fundamental basic research that we conducted under our previous award and transition it uh, to uh, the powder renew test bed. Uh, for those of you in the audience that you might not, you, are not, you might not be familiar with powder. Uh, this is one of the four uh, platforms for advanced wireless research, which is, as George said, uh, based in uh, Utah. Uh, and uh, uh, right now we are uh, using one of their massive MIMO base stations, which you can see in the picture in the middle, um, uh, which consists of 48 antenna. Uh, uh, elements uh, and with the tribot in front of the base station, we are essentially collecting uh, using the data that has been collected in this anechoic chamber in different uh, locations. And uh, the uh, the methodology that we are applying and what is really different from from the state of the art here is uh, L1 norm based data set summarization. So instead of you know traditionally uh, using uh, uh, L2 norm principal component analysis method methods that have been used over the years for for music direction finding uh, in in the signal processing literature. We are changing the paradigm here, um, uh, and we are looking for uh, for uh, subspaces that that are maximizing uh, the the uh, the L1 norm uh, of, uh, of 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 our data, right? Uh, the, the impact here is that we can get uh, high quality uh, estimates of the uh, angle of arrival of our signal, uh, both in azimuth and in elevation. Uh, we are doing that uh, in uh, sub six gigahertz frequencies for now, because this is the frequencies that uh, the powder and new test bed is working on. Uh, 
this, however, can be used as a proxy uh, for hardening channel maps uh, and improved uh, downlink beamforming, uh, as George uh, mentioned, even in millimeter wave frequencies, uh, which is important for, for next generation wireless networks. Uh, and finally, and most importantly, we uh, are uh, developing experimental profiles uh, that are stored in the Powder Renew uh, test bed that can be used in the future for uh, repeating uh, research uh, in massive MIMO positioning algorithms. George, if you want to advance one slide. Great, so this is some of the preliminary experimental results that we have acquired in the lab, uh, in our lab, uh, and this has been the first step uh, before we uh, test uh, with uh, the massive MIMO test method powder. Uh, so what you see here is we have a setup with uh, software defined radios similar to the ones that are used in the powder test bed. Uh, how, the only difference is that we have a smaller number of antenna elements. So we have a receiver with four antenna elements and we have two transmitters. Uh, one, tra one is the, transmit the legitimate user as George showed you before and the second user is, is an interferer. Uh, so it's not only eavesdropping but it's actively uh, putting power out in the channel. Uh, on the right side, and what's important from this slide to get, is uh, the performance of uh, detecting uh, the angle of arrival of the legitimate user. So the legitimate user is, uh, is, uh, is at zero degrees uh, with respect to uh, the broadside of, of our antenna array. Uh, and you see that with the red line is the performance of uh, our direction of arrival estimation algorithm when we apply our uh, L1 norm uh, subspace estimation algorithm. With blue color uh, on the other side, you see what's the performance of what's considered to be state of the art for direction of arrival estimation, uh, which is based on the, on the traditional uh, L2 norm principal component analysis. Uh, so the, 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 idea, the, the, the idea here is that you, 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 can, you can estimate with very high accuracy the, uh, uh, the azimuth uh, angle of arrival uh, and then you can use that uh, for being forming and securing your links as, as, as George uh, showed before. Uh, I think George has lost connectivity. So uh, maybe I can share myself uh, one last slide uh, uh, that concludes. Uh, so ongoing work uh, here is to adapt uh, the source code that we have been using for our experiments in the lab uh, before we uh, tested uh, over the air in, in the outdoor setup uh, that, that Powder offers with a massive memo base station, uh, we are uh, checking for calibration errors that might be affecting uh, our estimation algorithms. And this could come uh, when uh, different antenna elements in the array might be uh, non-synchronized in time, there might be other, uh, uh, other phase synchronization issues or uh, gain uh, issues uh, that, that we are working on currently, and we are closely working with, with the powder personnel on that. Um, and finally, uh, calculate uh, L1 norm-based direction of arrival uh, for azimuth and elevation for fixed endpoints uh, uh, and UEs that are deployed uh, both indoors and outdoors uh, in the powder test beds. Uh, here, uh, I have some evaluation metrics. Primarily, we are looking for experimental uh, root mean squared error of our direction of arrival estimation errors, direct, direction of arrival estimation algorithms. And secondly, we are looking at what could be the impact on the signal to noise ratio and the quality of the link uh, but, uh, that, that uh, this, uh, this DOA estimates would have. Um, with that, I think we would like to thank everybody for attending and feel free to uh, send questions through the Q&A or through the chat. Either me or George can, can pick them up and, and uh, chat offline. Thank you. Thank you, Yoros. And yes, please do ask your, your questions in the chat um, and whatever we won't be able to address directly here because I see time is really um, short now, we will address by email. Um, and there was a raised hand, but I don't see it anymore. So for now, I'll pass the floor. Thanks, Guido, I see you already, you're ready. So I'll pass the floor to you, thanks. Yes. Share the screen. Oh. 
Okay. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, I'm Guido Marchetto from uh, Politecnico di Torino. I'm going to present uh, our project, Distributed Learning for Resilient uh, Virtual Network Management at Scale, which was funded uh, in the frame of the fourth open call. It's a joint project with uh, St. Louis University and uh, in particular uh, with the uh, Professor Flavio Esposito's group. So let me briefly introduce uh, the, the problem. Uh, our networks are uh, dealing with today uh, with new demanding and data intensive applications, demanding uh, mainly in terms of uh, uh, very low latency requirements and also in terms of throughput requirements. Uh, here you can see some examples. So there are many scenarios that have this kind of requirements augmented reality industrial 4.0. Uh, let me mention one as an example. In the healthcare scenario, we can uh, uh, imagine, for example, a, a telepathology system where doctors, remotely connected doctors, have to share uh, very big images during maybe during a surgery. Uh, so, of course, uh, with uh, very strict uh, requirements concerning the latency. So basically, uh, our networks re require an increasing, uh, uh, I mean, there is an increasing need actually for uh, performance, scalability, and resilience. And uh, we would like that uh, these uh, features are actually offered uh, in an autonomous way so that the network is able to self adapt uh, in order to provide the uh, required. Um, quality actually, in order to support the uh, application. Of course, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning are um, a possible way uh, of introducing this uh, uh, self, -adapt self adaptation in the network management. And uh, uh, in this context, uh, reinforcement learning has been recognized uh, as a valid solution uh, to apply in uh, our networks. There are many papers approving this. Um, when the data set is large, uh, of course, uh, it would be better to use uh, what it is referred to the deep reinforcement learning. So with uh, many layers uh, of our uh, neural, neural network. Uh, but the, the question is, uh, does it scale? I mean, the, how can we scale this solution uh, in uh, real networks that are actually complex and big systems? So basically, the objectives of, the, of our project are to experiment with deep reinforcement learning for self-adapting for, for self networks. And in particular, uh, we would like to uh, understand how to scale neural network training, so the, the problem of uh, training the network, and uh, how to distribute this effort among nodes. Uh, some uh, possibilities are federated learning or split learning, so we would like to understand what, uh, which solution would be better in our uh, context. But uh, another uh, objective that we have, that we, that probably is the most ambitious uh, uh, in our project, uh, is the development uh, of a user interface to uh, facilitate further experiments by the community. So we would like to uh, develop uh, an interface that other people can use in order to experiment with this kind of problem. So maybe um, you, you can, by means of this interface, you can select the uh, machine learning method that you prefer to use, uh, or maybe in this uh, deep reinforcement learning, you can select federated learning or split learning, or you can also define the uh, specific parameter that you want to use in your experiment. For example, in the federated learning context, uh, maybe you can select uh, the aggregation method or whatever. Okay, so uh, 
this is uh, our second uh, uh, objective um, that uh, our second object that we have uh, in our project actually the project uh, is just started uh, the kickoff was on march uh, first the first so we are uh, at the at the beginning of, of our uh, joint collaboration uh, so in a few words uh, the experiment is represented uh, in this picture, so basically we want to get um, data from the from the network, and uh, we want to work in the green box that you can see in this slide, where we have the uh, auto scaling logic. So basically, by means of the data acquired from the network, uh, our logic in a scalable way, and this is actually what we want to experiment with. Uh, will define proper routing, proper uh, maybe uh, fault reaction uh, policies. Uh, it can also perform power control. I mean, uh, all the elements that are within the network management uh, uh, can be uh, programmed, can be um, driven by this uh, uh, auto scaling logic. And uh, after the, uh, the algorithm actually uh, has the proper output, this output can be used for programming the network by means of the actions that you can see in the uh, right part of the picture. Um, we plan to run our experiments uh, on Gini because uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, we mainly care about scalability. We want to check we want to test how this uh, uh, deep learning can be used uh, in a scalable way in uh, big networks. So Gini uh, is a, a proper testbed for this. Together with uh, Chameleon, uh, we plan to use Chameleon maybe uh, mainly for the, um, because, because of the GPUs that are there, so for, for the training part. And then, as uh, I was saying, uh, we would like to um, implement uh, this web interface uh, for the logic programmability, so for uh, changing the uh, intelligence, changing the green block. And then, after the, the, um, the, 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 the experiment is actually programmed, we would like to have uh, an automatic deployment on the testbed, so in this case on Genie and Chameleon. We were also planning to use Fabric. We uh, asked for uh, an, um, an early a beta tester account, but uh, I guess uh, we cannot use it. But in any case, Gini is, uh, uh, is a good place in my view. So I guess uh, uh, by means of Gini and Chameleon, we can uh, came out with uh, significant results. Uh, as a hint for uh, applicants, what I can share, uh, according to, to my experience, this is just my opinion, of course, uh, is that uh, one of the strengths of our project was the consortium synergy, uh, in the sense that uh, we have a long time collaboration with the US partner, with St. Louis University. We have many uh, joint papers together uh, um, on this topic, and so actually uh, simplify the, the, the process of, uh, you know, finding something to experiment. Since uh, these kind of projects are mainly referred to experiments, uh, this was, a, let's say, a, a, a good starting point for having something concrete to experiment with. Okay, that's all from my side. If you have any question, I share my email, this slide. Thank you, Guido. Thanks a lot. Uh, Jim, so I, I know that Deep is going to leave in 10 minutes, but there are still two projects presentations. So maybe we'll go uh, through the projects presentations since it's uh, already Yes. Uh, 535. And maybe if there are questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat as I see that Jim is answering in the meantime. And 
um, we'll, we'll save some time by that. Okay. okay. And I, I will now pass the floor to Nicolas. Nicolau. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, hi, Christina. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Uh, okay, I'm going to try to be short because I know that time is pressing. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Nicolas de Guelau. I'm uh, the co-founder of uh, Algolysis. Uh, Algolysis is an SME uh, located in the beautiful island of Cyprus, that is the eastmost member of the EU. And we focus mainly in uh, research around um, distributed systems, computer graphics, and uh, data science. Uh, in Algolysis, what we believe to be the next generation of the internet uh, we believe that it demands reliable, dependable, and scalable uh, services. Uh, so in this project, we study ARIS, uh, along with our collaborators in uh, Penn State, uh, which is a next-generation consistent dynamic distributed storage service that aims to redefine the way that devices and humans alike share information and manipulate data on the cloud. Um, Okay, in a glance, um, Aris is a, as I said, is a shared distributed storage system that operates on top of asynchronous um, fail-prone uh, devices that communicate through messages. So as uh, happens in most of the distributed storage systems that we know of, uh, in order to ensure availability and survivability, Aris uses redundancy. Redundancy of information, so data are copied among uh, a set of, uh, of servers and are distributed to the clients. However, if we combine asynchrony with redundancy, they don't go very well. What we mean by that, asynchrony may uh, introduce concurrent operations, meaning that multiple clients may try to access the data at the same time. So this creates some uh, issues because multiple clients may communicate with different servers. So how can we ensure the consistency of the data when we have those ma that many operations? Uh, so we have to define the behavior of concurrent operations. And by that, we have different consistency semantics. Aris ensures the strongest of those semantics, which is atomicity. So atomicity, in a few words, it ensures that um, uh, clients uh, have the illusion that the storage is sequential and they are ordered in a sequential manner, even though the operations can be concurrently accessing the same storage space. Uh, so now by that, uh, we have uh, the main uh, idea of Aris. However, we see that if failures are ongoing in the, in, the, uh, in the system, we have the problem that how can we ensure the liveness of the whole system if we have those failures to be persistent? So Aris uh, uh, incorporates a configuration mechanism that uh, allows the set of hosts to change from one set of, uh, of servers to a different set of servers or what we call configurations. So with this, uh, in this manner, we are able to avoid any persistent failures. So the system continues to be alive despite those failures in, um, in the service. Uh, what is uh, notable and what is uh, nice about the, the protocol is that it allows the read and write operations to continue to operate despite their configuration, uh, the ongoing configuration. So we do not have blocking operations. We do not have any operations to stop in the middle. So the nice properties and the three properties that we get out of the protocol is fault tolerance using redundancy, is the strict consistency, that is atomicity, and we get the longevity of the service despite any failures in the system due to reconfigurations. Uh, there are three main elements that uh, are used in, um, in ARIS in order to ensure that uh, uh, that basically makes Aris unique uh, with respect to other protocols in this area. The first one is modularity. Modularity separates the configuration service from the implementation of the consistent storage. Uh, and uh, this gives us the advantage of uh, adaptiveness. This leads to adaptiveness. What is adaptiveness? Adaptiveness is that uh, we can use a different distributed consistent storage per configuration that we introduce. And uh, why is that um, a benefit? A benefit for applications that want to use a, a different consistent storage that may trade fault tolerance for performance or performance for fault tolerance. And so they can switch 
all the time from configuration to configuration. And finally, adaptiveness leads to erasure coding, which is uh, at, the, at the heart of, uh, of ARIS and is one of the consistent storage uh, implementations that we're gonna use in our experiments as well. And um, erasure co coding gives the advantage of, um, uh, of uh, efficient storage in the servers, as now we do not have to keep the whole copy of the data in each replica host, but instead we only have to keep one fragment of the data in each server. So this protocol was actually uh, developed um, uh, by a group in, uh, in uh, MIT, and uh, the correctness of the protocol was proven uh, uh, rigorously with the solid, uh, solid mathematical foundations. Um, and so now the question was, what is the performance of this protocol if we are to apply that in a practical system and in a real system? That's why we got the initiative with um, uh, Associate Professor Vivek Dambe from uh, Penn State, a collaborator of mine as well. And um, uh, we thought to uh, implement the algorithm and try to see how it performs in a, in a real system. And actually NGI Atlantic was a perfect match for us because we are established in Cyprus and he's established in the United States. So we were able to uh, keep our bonds and continue our collaboration. And, uh, and with the funds from AGI Atlantic, we were able to dedicate resources in conducting the experiments. Just to give you a glance of uh, what the experiment will look like. Uh, first of all, um, the experiment is gonna uh, involve three different stages. In the first stage, we're gonna implement, we're gonna develop the protocols and deploy the protocols. As a previous presenter already said, uh, developing the protocols from scratch in this, um, in this project is not a very good idea because we don't have too much time. So we already have a prototype of, uh, of the implementation that we're gonna enhance and use for our experiments. Uh, deploy the protocols, we're gonna deploy the protocols in both the uh, EU and United States. Uh, now we, we plan to deploy our protocols in um, fed for fire test beds in the European Union, uh, which is uh, uh, the grid 5000 and possibly the, the virtual wall and also dedicate some resources in our company to be able to put our, um, our algorithms into, into stress test. And uh, also we're gonna um, uh, deploy uh, the, the algorithm in some um, uh, resources uh, devoted by the Penn State. They have some uh, power computers and a cluster of, uh, of PCs that we're gonna be able to use for our experiments. Then we're gonna test our algorithms. We're gonna test the performance, scalability, and fault tolerance through different scenarios that are going to put our uh, algorithm in many different uh, test variables. We're going to be able to see how the protocol reacts in different um, uh, environmental conditions. And finally, we're going to try to identify strengths and weaknesses and performance bottlenecks of the protocol. And this is going to give us a very nice know-how and very nice knowledge of what uh, are, the, um, are the things that we need to improve in our protocol. Now, what is the, the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal uh, from this project and what uh, would be a, a, a nice outcome uh, for us is to get enough know-how in order to progress towards the introduction of a new paradigm in this uh, area, which is a memory as a service for the next generation of the internet. A memory as a service will be a natural step for global and cloud-based applications and uh, will give definitely will give a definitely competitive advantage to a small SME uh, like Alcolis. Um, so that was from me. Thank you very much. Christina, back to you. Thanks very much, Nicolau. And we are we're really glad when we hear that um, that NGI Atlantic has helped you actually bring forward this collaboration. So I see Viviana is ready. Uh, sorry, Viviana, for yes. we're being uh, so late with the with the presentations, but um, I'll okay. give the floor to you. Thanks. Uh, so good afternoon, I am Viviana Rigoni and together with my advisor Novella and with our partner in the US, King, uh, we wrote this project that is called uh, Vulnerability Assessment a Robust Defenses for Optimized Attacks in Dynamic SDNs and uh, it was uh, granted by NGI during the first call. 
uh, Novell and Ting has collaborated for quite a while and uh, we have been continuing to collaborate together. And uh, so we came out, we came out with, uh, with this project. Then this is somehow the storytelling. I will try to be um, as brief as possible. So basically we are in uh, uh, software, in the field of software defined networks, and these are emerging architectures with a centralized control plan. Now they have the, um, they, they, they actually can improve programmability and management of uh, uh, the network, but still they come with many challenges, especially uh, uh, dealing with network security. So our idea is the following. What we want to do is to implement a monitoring system for software, software defined networks via network tomography. Uh, and uh, this uh, with, with the hope and the belief that network tomography is able to detect some problems inside the network that are instead transparent to the SDN controller. One of these uh, problems may be caused by, by cache pollution attacks that are attacks that uh, cause delay uh, by uh, polluting the flow tables of, um, uh, of the uh, SDN switches. And um, in, we want our monitoring system to be able to localize these kind of attacks and uh, to provide defense for such attacks. So first of all, we are going to provide a proactive defense by implementing dynamic rerouting and provisioning and also a reactive defense by implementing adaptive rule replacement policy um, techniques. And here are the experiments that we're going to carry out. So we are going to um, be um, testing our, our system on a small prototype that we have here in, uh, in Rome. And then we will also run tests on uh, a distributed and local emulators, in particular using Cloud Lab and MinNet. Uh, now I'm really uh, running out of time, but this is a very small example. Actually, this is our uh, the architecture of our prototype. And uh, I'm not going through the details because it is late, but more or less what we want to do is to adapt uh, in a um, uh, resilient way with respect to the SDN controller, the flows uh, through the network uh, when an attacker comes in and performs some kind of cache pollution attacks. Um, so if you want any details, you can uh, email me and uh, I'm not sure that I am the right person to give hints, but uh, uh, so because this is the first time that I apply to uh, an NGI Atlantic uh, project. But uh, what I would say is that, uh, you, you know, there are different topics inside uh, for, for, each, for each call and you want to be specific. Uh, do you want to really understand what the call is about and uh, propose something that um, well adapts to, to the topic of the call. Also, you will not have uh, much time for uh, new research. So make sure that you can use your own research. And um, also, uh, at least during the fourth call, uh, we were not allowed to use the grant for buying new equipment. So make sure that you have uh, your own equipment ready for the experiments that you want to carry out. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Viviana. Um, thanks all, first of all, for, for staying longer um, because we, we ran out of time, but we see that you were all year until the end. So this is great. And uh, we're happy if it means that we like the, the webinar was useful for you. I'll pass the floor to you, Jim, in case you want to say yes, some. Th th rest. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, Vivian. You, you actually made my, my job very easy to close because you covered two of the frequently asked questions at the end of your presentation. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking to do research uh, that, you know, this is not the right place, um, you know, to do that, you should be going to some of our sister projects, you know, where they are funding the research and development work in the topics, um, you know, so you should be coming with results, which you can experiment with um, a US team. Um, so that, that's uh, very good information. And we do only fund for personnel and for travel costs, okay? So just very quickly, <clears throat> um, thank you for staying on so long, but I, I just wanna cover two things. Um, and then there's many, many slides with FAQ, which, which you can see um, uh, later on. But I just wanted to mention 
that um, you know there is a, a um, uh, the DOH that's required. Um, it's a um, uh, to be submitted with the application, and it it only has to be signed by the European coordinator. However, the U.S. team's PI must include a signed letter of support within. Uh, it's I'm sorry, it's declaration of honor, not description of honor. <clears throat> So um, the USPI uh, must include a signed letter with that, okay? And then um, just include details on past and or present NGI applications and EU H2020 applications. And this is purely for st um, statistical reasons. Um, the NGI initiative is designed to try to attract you know, the entrepreneurs and the innovators, which, you know, would normally not be involved in, you know, the larger H2020 um, uh, program. So what they do is they, they're, you know, collecting the statistics to see how well they're doing in that regard. Okay, so that's why we're asking for this information in your proposal or in your application. It, you know, it won't be used in any way, shape, or form in the evaluation. It's just used for, you know, the purposes of the, you know, statistical uh, information that we, we are asked to, you know, as our project uh, by the European Commission to provide to them on a regular basis. Okay. Um, the other thing, um, the, the general agreement between the coordinator, which is Waterford IT, and the winning projects is non-negotiable apart from the standard um, customization that gets done with uh, with with the, you know the winning teams, and <clears> that this is something um, that we really will have to stick to for especially for this last open call because we won't have much time um, in in the period. Um, between the end of evaluations and project start dates. Um, but don't worry, we provide the standard contract template online and you know you, you can download it and you know make sure you have your legal departments check it um, as soon as possible. okay, but there won't be any negotiation um, allowed apart from the typical changes that have to be made. Okay, and all the documentation can be found at the website shown here. Okay, um, so uh, you can have a multi-team, um, you know, application, and you know, but just explain, you know, the the specific roles of each of the partners, obviously. Okay, and then um, we now have a clear downloadable PDF version. And just in terms of the travel, there's been a lot of questions on this. Um, and so in normal times, what we've been recommending is, um, you know, for a six month duration of two, two travels, one to sort of get the, you know, the experiment set up and then, you know, one, um, you know, either in the interim or at the, or at the final stages. And then, you know, in terms of the COVID-19 advice that we're providing at the moment, you know, the block on travel, from EU member states to the USA is no longer in effect. Um, so you, you, know, you can consider travel options um, and that, that can be reflected in your application. However, it's our understanding that um, uh, from US participants that they would prefer you know, in general to have the EU partner involved in the experiment set up. You know, and this is uh, you know, something we're recommending. But please continue to watch the space in relation to any remaining travel restrictions and requirements you know, in case there's any changes happening. Um, because I, I know I was in the US in January when they changed the test requirements getting back to Ireland where they removed the requirements, but they had still had the requirements if you went back to the States to be tested. So you, know, you have to be um, still be very diligent about the, the different restrictions that are out there. Okay, so with that, um, uh, I'll, I'll finish here. And then, as I mentioned, we have plenty of other FAQs. And then also please feel uh, free to email us uh, as well if you have any, any questions and we'll be happy to answer them. Okay, so uh, back to you, Christina.
Christina, I think you're muted. Yeah, no, hi, Jim. Sorry, I had a, a connection issue and I, I la <laughs> missed the last couple of minutes, I think. So um, if you ask me something, I, I missed the... No, that, that's okay. Just the, there is one question here. Can the DOH and LOS be in different files? Um, yes, 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 yes. Yes, they can. And, and they don't, I don't believe they have to be signed with electronic certificates. No, no, that's that's not necessary. No, no, I don't think so. No, um, no. If, yeah, if if you have any follow up questions on that, please let us know. We we can explain it. There is a template for the DOH and the LOS that you can just download. It's um, it's very straightforward. And as I mentioned, the US one only has to be signed by the PI that you're involved with. Um, because um, typically it takes months and months to get um, the actual legal representatives to sign anything in the US. And in case you have any problem with the upload, um, contact us on, on the uh, contact at NGI atlantic.eu or info at and we will uh, there there is the the address also on the call page but maybe Jacopo, you can share it in the chat and uh, we will get back to you in case there is any um, technical problem in uploading the the application okay and i'd also like to thank all of our speakers today for their very insightful presentations and thanks to Deep um, for attending as well on such short notice. And, and he sent a message to me that if you have any other questions for him, his contact details are in the um, DCL link that we provided, or you can contact me directly if that's, if that's easier for you. Okay, so I think we can conclude Christina. Yes, thank you all for joining. And once again, we will share the recording uh, very soon on our website and we will send it out also. Um, we will put the link on social media and newsletter. So please follow us if you aren't doing so on our social media and we will share any relevant information over there. And once again, thank you all. Thanks for our thanks to our wonderful speakers for joining us today and to you for staying even longer which is uh, really great. Thank you. Have a nice evening all.